welcome back to the Rachel Mister Dot Com Rider Chicken Show. Trade your trading plans. Don't take too much risk on any one trade, and just let yourself get rich. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Brother Chicken Show. I uh, hope you're getting used to our new little intro there. It's probably a good idea for us to uh, get a little bit crisper in our delivery here. So i uh, feeling pretty proud of the team for doing that. Um, and I'm not quite sure how. I'm going to have to listen back to these videos for a while. I'm not quite sure how to start these things off because, of course, uh, in the past, uh, Brian has his crazy clucking sounds and all that. But uh Actually, one of the video software uh, pieces that we used, uh, I'd go do all my clucking and the sound, of course, would be cut out and Chris would be like, they didn't, they didn't hear you. <laughs> so uh, anyway, point of the matter here is welcome back. Uh, hopefully we'll have some fun looking at some price charts and uh, talking a little bit uh, through uh, my sort of tweets about uh, Bitcoin I like to do on a weekly basis here for you guys. Just give you a sort of an overview you can always refer back to the uh, the tweets uh, through the week. Um, so if you are sort of watching actively uh, these videos week to week, take a screenshot, go on Twitter. And, you know, like I said, uh, you can go on Twitter and just grab this. And, you know, I got to tell you, man, this has been such a beautiful education uh, this past, uh, geez, I'd say even a couple months uh, on how uh, megaphones uh, play themselves out. Also, too, I kind of tell you, this has been absolutely beautiful demonstration um, of things like trade setups. Uh, and I wanted to show you uh, uh, literally from probably, I guess, maybe about a month or so ahead of the actual breakdown happening. Uh, I was talking everybody through this. In fact, the headline was bearish trade setups appear to be setting up. So nothing actually even happened. Uh, as of here, but we've just basically walked you through uh, this whole trade setup working its way. And of course, the latest uh, uh, version of this, actually, maybe that's not the latest one. Anyway, one of these uh, prices coming off here. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, it's somewhere around here. I don't know. That's one of these. There we go. So you can see as this setup is working away. Um, and actually, for people that are on the site, uh, we even have that. Uh, the trade data just uh, right on the screen. So every day I can see how this uh, silly little setup that we took actually, that's a 30 minute chart, but uh, probably best to see it off of something like the daily. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, oh, it's not on here. Uh, maybe the four hour chart's the best place to see it. Anyway, you can see uh, this is the four hour chart and we'll get to this in a moment, but there is that short position off of that level. And just working away, doing its thing. Anyway, so on a daily basis, uh, when we do the daily briefs and stuff, I like to just sort of give people updates. Well, how's this setup working away? Uh, and really, there's no reason to touch that whatsoever right now. Um, but I suppose maybe if I take a few minutes and walk us through uh, the uh, the charts from higher time frame down to lower time frame, at least maybe you have an understanding of what I think is going on here in the market. Uh, as well, too, a uh, big sort of priority of today um, is to uh, address the uh, level one students. And uh, uh, also, too, I suppose if uh, other students have questions, you know, feel free to uh, post in that uh, in the Ask Me Anything document. We've got a couple questions ready to go here for today. Um, but, um, yeah, might, uh, you know, as we're blabber blabbering away here. I see there's a good uh, 20 people or so over there on the YouTube page. Uh, and, uh, you know, as people sort of come in, if uh, somebody has a question, we should probably direct them to this document. But I think this is just for students and uh, site members. So <clears throat> one question from a new person to the site and one question uh, from a site vet. So uh, uh, feel free to add to that. But second part of the broadcast here today, hopefully we'll address that. Uh, I was actually quite pleased. Um, I had mentioned it to Chris. I think we're going to try and do like a sort of a weekly summary newsletter. Um, and so what has sort of happened in the TRI verse here, let's move this over here. 
uh, since last Sunday, which I guess was the seventh, you know, any major econs of note um, and uh, also any video references and stuff in sort of a one page or PDF uh, that I think would be a really good little piece of dovetail piece uh, to this. I'm not quite sure if we have it sort of sent out an email and you give us your email address and it becomes part of uh, sort of the regular offering, or maybe we just for now will embed the link to the PDF uh, in the uh, video description. We're still hashing that out. But point of the matter here is over this past week, actually we had a really awesome, and I can't believe it was Monday because it feels like it was like two weeks ago, but uh, we had a really fun uh, time. Uh, where the heck is it? Uh, chatting with the people over at Hero. Uh, and uh, we actually had Colin, uh, the uh, the gentleman here, second from the top in this video in particular. Um, but we had Colin on the uh, on the week uh, the daily brief after party, sort of our site member video that we do uh, on a daily basis uh, for you know site members uh, on Friday. And he and I had a fantastic conversation. Although somebody commented that I was interrupting him too much. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it's a, it's a good thing or a bad thing, but at some point with these YouTube videos and students and stuff, they actually feel as though they're like on like basically a first name basis that they can critique my interviewing style and stuff. You know, f frankly speaking, if you don't like my style, you, you're always welcome to uh, poke Colin and ask him if you you could do an interview with him. <laughs> anyway. Uh, crazy world. But anyway, so the point of the matter is, is uh, if there was going to be a video link on the uh, on the uh, PDF weekly summary, I'd mentioned this to Chris. I think this is this is a really fun conversation that we had with the gang. And then, like I said, if you want sort of a follow up to this, we had Colin come on the uh, day, uh, the after party on Fridays and Friday afternoons is when I like to invite either course instructors, you know, everybody in the level one just got an awesome session with Graham. And he even says things in the level one education program that are just, they're just so perfect. And there was a couple of times, even through today's class, you know, I, I like to uh, sort of audit all the classes just to uh, see if uh, the message is on point. And there was a couple of times in, in class, even today, that it was just like, oh, Grim, I could not have said that any better. It was just so perfect. The way that he said it, I think, frankly speaking, he's turning into a much better educator trader than I am. And that's good. It's exactly what's supposed to happen. Um, you know, we got Chris here's turning into opening range trader boss. So cool. Uh, so, you know, I, the, the cool part about it is that uh, we just got to figure out what appeals to you as an individual and then just leverage those strengths. Um, anyway, so... I just see Chris uh, sitting over here uh, uh, auditing the uh, the call here today. Of course, he's just monitoring. We caught him with his pants down the other day. So <laughs> if anything, I would just want to look over and see that he's still here. But I suppose, hey, everybody, you know, Brian talks so damn. You know, Brian, how am I supposed to hold a piss for two and a half hours, three hours? I mean, come on. <laughs> so I totally empathize. <laughs> anyway, uh, where was I? So uh, it was a fun week. It was a fun week because the irony of it all this, of course, this past week was Brian's birthday there on Thursday. And I warned everybody in the universe that uh, Bitcoin hates Brian's birthday. And to add insult to injury, what was the fundamental driver uh, to cause the price of Bitcoin to break? I think it's because, you know, everybody that's sort of in the know, especially at Binance, uh, they knew they were going, coming down with some ugly FUD about how uh, my beloved uh, country uh, has uh, decided to uh, ask Mr. CZ to uh, politely uh, leave the premises. <laughs> and frankly speaking, it doesn't surprise me. In fact, I think there was even a question in the uh, Q&A document. I mean, you have to understand capitalism. We're talking money here, right? This is cutthroat shit. Um, and the worst part about all this is that the capitalist markets, even though, uh, well, and how do you describe this? You know, I think the absolute best way to describe this conversation is, 
Let's see if I can find it on. I know Shark Toshi, he always posts this image and it's so perfect. Uh, let's see, how am I going to do this? So, uh, Robber Barons, uh, I'll say 19th century US politics cartoon. If you, uh, if you can think of the way that our system works, and really it hasn't changed one iota um, over the past few hundred years. In fact, it's kind of interesting. I don't know what the hell this is. Uh, this is the image I'm going for here. Um, you might even argue that uh, it's it's gotten worse because these guys, uh, they understand that there's sort of a framework that they have to work within, but as long as they hire enough lawyers, uh, and as long as you know those lawyers are uh, are directed a certain way, I mean, I, I don't know whether you guys are aware, but I think Trump has something like 1,100 active lawsuits against him right now. <laughs> 1,100. I mean, what the hell? I can't even count that high. I can only count as high as the amount of fingers and toes that I have on my body. After that, it gets a little crazy. So the point being that, uh, you know, like 200 years ago, these guys all sort of acted with impunity. And of course, in the previous sort of society, it wasn't democratic, really. Uh, and there wasn't any sort of legal framework that Joe Sixpack could really work with him. I think one of the hallmarks of the 20th century is that Joe Sixpack has actually been able to access the legal system, which means that the outright brutal and blatant corruptness of capitalism was partially brought in check. You know, things like chemical companies can't go and like pollute uh, ground without, you know, in fear of uh, Aaron Brockovich type lawsuits, right? That kind of thing. Everybody knows that movie, Aaron Brockovich, right? I think that's the right name. Did I say that right, Chris? Aaron Brockovich? I think that's right. Anyway, point is, is that, you know, that's what the 20th century sort of opened up. Like prior to the 20th century, they would have said, so fucking what? I don't care. <laughs> so now these guys, they're just as fat. I mean, you could argue Billy Gates. Uh, you could argue Jeff Bezos. You could argue Zuckerberg. You could argue Musk, right? I mean, you see the next generation of these guys coming along, the Walmart families, right? And, they, and the irony of it all is that these are all the politicians here, and they are nothing more than puppets of these big fat cats. So uh, there along comes this whole brand new industry, cryptocurrencies, and of course, a whole bunch of trading. Oh, man, trading, buy, sell, hedge. More importantly, Commission, 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 fee, 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 commission, fee, commission. You get the idea, right? So are these guys just going to sit there and just let all that business slip through their fingers? Easy money. I mean, running a business that generates commissions and stuff, that is the easiest business to run. If you, you know, it's literally like having a license to print money. It literally is. And, you know, I actually worked within the industry. I watched the guys, uh, you know, here in Vancouver. Uh, there used to be a Vancouver Stock Exchange and there used to be a whole bunch of local players. And actually, through the Great Depression, the banks had taken so much control of society. And of course, you know, the slavings and loans, everybody knows it's a wonderful life, all that kind of stuff. They were almost brought to ruin because of the crash in 29, which was a fantastic opportunity for these guys to consolidate power. And ironically enough, within the banking industry itself, this is exactly what's going on. These big fat cats, that's Joey Diamond. That's uh, Goldman Sachs. That's, um, you know, fill in the blank, Merrill Lynch. You know, there was a guy, Lehman Brothers, at one point here, but poof, he actually screwed over long-term capital management, which went bust, I think, in 1998. And all of these other guys ganged up on Lehman, and that's why Lehman went under. But shh, don't tell the public that story. Uh, they 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 won't uh, they won't swallow that. <laughs> Bear Stearns, right? There's another one in there. Uh, but you get the idea. I mean, our society is run by these people. No ifs, ands, or buts, uh, except maybe you know Brian's big butt. But that's just getting bigger and bigger. Hell, my ass is about as big as this guy's ass. But anyway, that's another conversation altogether. 
So, uh, you know, that's the world that we're living in. And I think what's happening in Canada right now is uh, I think that the financial services industry is absolutely brutally corrupt in our society. But because they own the politicians and they use all the right language and they have just an army of lawyers and they will sue you into non-existence. And more importantly, they'll actually even do things. They're so powerful. They can actually have like the government pointed at you and you can get audited into the ground. Oh, I don't think you actually filled that tax return out the other day uh, correctly. So bam, into jail you go and we seize all your property because of course uh, we have to recoup legal costs, blah, 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 blah. And it's all perfectly legal, perfectly uh, buttered over. <laughs> so, you know, that's what's going on here is um, my hunch is, you know, the interestingly enough, the... I've made the argument all along here that the cryptocurrency world, this technology, will be just absolutely incredible for the profit generating mechanism of it. You know, this whole idea of validation through blockchain, it, you know, for these guys, them running their businesses, whether it be a bank or an insurance company, or a brokerage house, or anything related to, you know, to, with the financial services industry, life insurance, uh, that whole, you know, uh, trading, right, all that stuff, commodity settlement, delivery, processing, clearing, whatever. I actually used to work in the operations department of a fairly large uh, brokerage house. In fact, and of course, as a broker, I also had to interact with the compliance departments and the cage and all that uh, in the brokerage business. And then, of course, you know, senior management and all that, they're on a completely different floor. Um, blockchain will literally make all of those jobs obsolete. And remember, for these guys, when they're running their business, the classic 20th century or even pre 20th century business model was about. Um, God, actually, I don't even know specifically what the figures are, to be honest with you. But typically, business models, labor is actually about two thirds of your cost of doing business. So if you can now, and especially with the advent of quote unquote AI, if you could have AI generated uh, sort of algorithms that process all of the transactions on the blockchain. And of course, everything is trackable. Everything has a timestamp. Everything has, is a completely electronic and completely auditable in a court of law. Well, you've just made two thirds of your cost of doing business just disappear. What's that gonna do to profit margins? And then more specifically, What's that going to do to stock prices? Because remember, most of these executives of these guys, he owns stock in JP Morgan. He owns stock in Goldman Sachs. He owns stock in Merrill Lynch, whatever, blah, 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 blah. So I think that's what's happening here in our society. 1% knows point blank that blockchain is going to just, it's going to, it, you know, there are, what are the reasons for this coming massive growth cycle? You know, I've shown you guys repeatedly over the years. I don't know if I can find it or not on the whim, uh, but I've shown you, let's see if I can do this. Who is going to test my skill? And I always fail. So let's see, maybe fingers crossed. I won't fail this time. Uh, we want to go macro cycles. And I think we call it like the millennial cycle, if I'm not mistaken. Millennial greed cycle, kind of like the millennial falcon. No, not really. Uh, is this it? Uh, no, that's not the chart I wanted. So close. Let's try again. Uh, maybe this one. Come on, baby. You can do it. You can do it. Are you going to do it for us? Yeah, all right. So... You know, this is coming out of the Great Depression, and I'm a big fan of cycles. I think that the universe moves in a very cyclic fashion, right? everything about us. It's all circles. 
So interestingly enough, if we, and this is what I'm teaching you guys in the level one, any level one is watching this right now, is that uh, you want to see what uh, these cycles look like over a long term? Well, they look something along these lines. Boom. So this is what I, this is what I really need for you to learn uh, as you go through this education program with me. That every single cycle, uh, every, every single sort of human generation uh, is goes through its respective uh, greed cycle where the generation uh, builds itself out. Uh, and from what I understand, this millennial generation is a big one. So uh, completely skip right over suckers like me. Generation X is like a blip. Um, and then once you sort of hit your peak earnings years, and you have to start transitioning into retirement, what does your respective fear cycle look like? And I think that we are well on our way into the millennials greed cycle. And actually the uh, the sort of white teal line here, this is the greatest generation, I guess it's gray, uh, what their cycle looked like relatively speaking. And the yellow line is what the baby boomers looked like. Now, I think the baby boomers, they outperformed an asset prices group uh, quite a bit more because they had interest rates at their back, right? 1980, 81, 82, the 80-year interest rate cycle pivoted. And for 40 years, we've been living in a falling interest rate environment. But that ain't the case anymore, folks. In fact, so I think that we're in this part cycle. So you could make the argument, and you don't even really see it here, but this was the, um, this was the um, how do you say this? The uh, Great Depression, I used to call it the post-Civil War baby boom. Um, it might even be like this, maybe the post-Gilded Age baby boom. Um, and through this part of the cycle from here all the way to here, they actually, um, uh, did I get that right? No, right, uh, right from here. Yeah, I, this, this cycle here. Um, they actually had to endure higher interest rates, rising interest rate environment. This was actually a falling interest rate environment from here to here. So uh, baby boomers look a heck of a lot like this. And the irony of it all is that this is what was supposed to happen. But because of the money printing, what actually happened was this. So it wasn't nearly as bad, but at the same time too, you know, the public looks at the market and goes, well, I don't see any crash. This thing looks like it's just going straight up. So it didn't actually really go straight up. It actually did this. And this is actually what I think our next growth cycle looks like, which means that holy free holies, when we actually get into the economy is going to grow now. Oh my goodness. The stock market's going to go bloody crazy here. Uh, you know, you're probably going to see unless unless one of two things happens. Number one, this thing actually like if you actually believe that the U.S. Federal Reserve is going to shrink the money supply materially and actually bring us back down into real money. Right now we're we're playing in ridiculous, uh, you know, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Weimar, Germany. They all and, you know, the, all of their societies end the same way. I do believe that Mr. Powell sees that now, and I actually think he is hell bent on actually trying to uh, rein in the money supply. This is going to be a really interesting historical event for us here, folks. And actually, I did have see someone asked, uh, "Well, what's going to happen if the U.S. does default?" Um, and actually, you know, I think on balance, the news headlines are going to re report that the U.S. does default. And I wouldn't even be surprised if that actually happens um, maybe sometime this summer. The irony of it all is that the bond market's probably going to love that. Because then that means, you know, once you go into default, all the interest rates all ratchet up. Uh, and, of course, that's going to absolutely kill the economy. Um, and, you know, maybe we go into some massive price deflation there. Uh, a lot of people are actually expecting us to have a bit of a trough here uh, into October. I think I've shown you that um, on balance, um, if we look at, um, 
think I have it in here, but I always show you the blog that uh, Josh does. He just does. In fact, you know what? That's an easier, faster way for me to do this. Uh, and also, too, you know, this blog is for free. I tell you, I don't think you're going to find any better research on Wall Street than this free blog. And this thing's freaking incredible. It's so beautiful. Hugs and kisses, Josh. You're awesome. Benner cycle, 23. You know, if anything, this would make perfect sense. U.S. government defaults. Everybody's in absolute tailspin panic. But it's not a real default. What? <laughs> and actually, this exact same thing happened in 1979. Somebody on the site actually found that for me, which I was quite surprised. Hello. wonder where that's coming from. Is that from you, Chris? Sorry, dude. Um, my apologies. What? How does that work? <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, way back when, um, uh, turns out that the U.S. did default in 1979. Somebody even found the news headline. It was, of course, totally buried. So I think to maybe inject a little bit of panic into the market this fall, because uh, like I said, what I think is going to happen this year, but this is just Brian, is I think that 2023 looks something like this. Do we have to make a lower low here in the market this fall? I don't know. I think that's all around sort of the official does the U.S. default or not. So what did I mean by that? Well, technically, technically of me, uh, I, what I was referring to is the United States of America's uh, fiscal year end is technically September sometime. I don't know whether it's September 1st or September 30th. I can't remember. Total knucklehead. And also, too, very interesting how the Canadian government and Binance has officially said that you have to be completely offloaded if you are a Canadian from Binance by September 30th. Oh, what a coincidence. Hmm. You get the feeling somebody, 1%, uh, where are our fat cats? Remember, these guys buy down markets, right? They don't buy up markets, but look how big and fat he is. How many of your Bitcoins does he have to buy to fill that big fat belly? And you look at Joey Diamond uh, there on um, on uh, social media and in public. He doesn't look this fat, but you know, think of his like karmic image. <laughs> he has a very very big tummy, and it's going to take a lot of you having to sell and him buying and literally buying the weakness. Uh, they that's the way these damn one percenters work, right? I want to buy when you're uh, crying and then sell to you when you're, yo, 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 Bitcoin, oh, going to the bad. Don't sell when it doubles, buy more. Oh, Jesus. I mean, the public, it's so cliche how stupid they are. Um, and yet the worst part about it is when we're going through it, they're so freaking arrogant. Ah, oh, you can't even talk sense to, uh, you know, I think it's like post-pubescent males. Um, I don't see it as much in the female, to be honest with you. And they've actually done studies over the years that females actually technically make better investors than males. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, how ironic. Uh, shouldn't the male population just be an absolute uproar? And 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 scream discrimination when I make a statement like that? Shouldn't that shouldn't that be just as woke invoking as you know somebody saying, well, you know, in professional sports, men usually do a little bit better playing rugby than women. You know, no, that's sexist. <laughs> but would you throw a, a you know a woman into a into the uh, into a rugby pitch with a whole bunch of you ever seen? The uh, New Zealand rugby team, whoo, they're scary. <laughs> the Maoris, oh goodness. Hey, I'm a male and they'll, they'll tear me apart. <laughs> so, hey, there you go. So Josh was sticking up for the, for the male population. I'm offended, but it's a fact. <laughs> Women actually make better investors than men. Oh, well, what, what can you do? Anyway, the point of the matter here is Joey here. He's going to create the perfect storm for you to absolutely freak out and, of course, panic sell into the lows. That's what they do. It is their plan, you know. 
to sort of avoid that, especially with regard to something like Bitcoin, there is one really, really simple way for you to avoid all of that. The only problem is none of you, I guarantee you, none of you are going to like this, this statement here. So if you're going to buy Bitcoins, uh, roughly what price, hint, 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 this is a concept I talk about all the time, uh, should you be trying to, quote unquote, invest in Bitcoin? And if you're not at those prices, then what the heck are you doing? It sounds to me like you're speculating, not investing. Price of thank you, Kevin. Cost of production. Excellent, Adam. Good for you. Um, <laughs> and if you're a technician, just buy the buy, buy Brian's favorite fib. <laughs> And of course, uh, there's always uh, the cat's already on to risk management, so she knows how much uh, you should uh, put into any trade that you do in any idea anywhere. Because uh, when the market does come off, man, it's really good to have a big pile of cash to save your butt and actually give you the ability to buy more when prices do do come down. So anyway, so uh, I definitely believe, without a shadow of a doubt, and also too. What you're also, I think you're going to find is that people are going to try and really hush up this kind of conversation. Um, and because the 1% wants to freak you out in selling. And remember, and I'm starting to hear it being talked about in public, the government, can you make the case that, uh, how do we say this? Can you make the case that there has been a precedent set for governments to outlaw the public's participation in owning certain assets in the marketplace. Has it ever happened before in our modern day society where you, Joe Sixpack, your right to buy or sell an asset in particular has ta been taken away from you? And obviously, uh, Coke knows the answer to this. Chris, do you know the answer? Do you want to say anything? Uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> well, probably wise. Brian sticking his neck into the noose very slowly <laughs> on this Mother's Day. Uh, and keep in mind, once I'm done with you, I get to go play mother and father <laughs> to, to my son this afternoon. So I, I wear both hats in our family. <laughs> So, and the answer, unfortunately, is yes. Um, so, I don't think that, uh, interestingly enough, right, I don't think it's possible for these Western governments, especially sort of the Democrat, bureaucrat-based uh, governments, I don't think it's actually possible for them to outlaw something like DeFi. Because it would literally mean going house to house and checking people's browser history. And the government just doesn't have those kind of resources. But is there low hanging fruit that they could pass some pretty simple legislation? And of course they have precedent now because there are uh, certain individuals in our society who have uh, gone and abused the public's trust uh, in the building out of this technology to the tune of billions of dollars that were technically completely fraudulent transactions, um, can Western governments now justify saying things like, uh, you as a citizen of this country no longer have the right uh, or the privilege, and if you want to maintain citizenship here, uh, you better keep your act uh, clean, better keep your nose clean, and if you get audited, you're in big doo-doo. Um, would it help in directing any kind of business that maybe the public wanted to do in a certain group's direction? Regardless of whether this group decides to follow the rules or not, if they own these people down here, then these people down here 
will actually go out of their way to actually set the rules up to benefit these people up here. I think you understand exactly where I'm going with all this. So ironically enough, and I've said this repeatedly in the past too, and it's not very popular in this space, but probably one of the worst possible things that could happen to our rights as individuals uh, in our society was uh, both the rise of, and then the subsequent collapse of uh, the Soviet Union and this whole international communist movement. That was sort of the, you know, if you could maybe like envision, especially if you think about interest rates and their peak uh, in 1980, uh, these guys here, they were most worried in 1979, heading into those Russian Olympics. And, you know, ironically enough, why did interest rates have to go up as high as they did uh, through the 1970s? You can make the argument that uh, international trade unionism, sort of workers' rights, was at it, its absolute peak. And, you know, just so you understand, uh, you know, just... Uh, um, Let's see if I'm going to do Interest rates through that 1980 period were absolutely off the map in a historical comparison. And I don't think a lot of people in society realize this. So, you know, here's a good example of how crazy it was, right? So uh, that's 3000 BC. <laughs> I don't know how relevant that is. Um you can see around the U.S. Civil War, especially for like the Americans, it would make sense. So the cost of money, of course, went skyrocketing higher there. Uh, but here is sort of your, uh, and here you can see long-term interest rates, right? Why on earth did interest rates go that high through that particular interest rate cycle? And the answer was, in my eyes, that human beings actually had a half-decent standard of living. <laughs> they had a half-decent life. And, you know, the companies, these guys were actually expected to pay workers uh, a fair salary, fair wages. Competition was, you know, most relevant. Ralph Nader, you know, those kind of guys, they were the, at sort of the pin. We, as a species, we hit some sort of significant pivot through this event. And I would actually make the argument, sadly, that that was probably the peak of our sort of Western civilization standard of living. And now the collective standard of living of all of us, you and I, it's collapsing in our faces. And these guys, sadly, are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've made the argument that we're probably going back to sort of that Scrooge type world. Uh, you know, a Christmas Carol, uh, you know, the 1%, the relative wealth distribution is just staggering. Mm -hmm. Probably going to go back to the world of things like debtors, prisons. Uh, I do find it interesting that, you know, even, you know, over the past five, 10 years, simple things like an individual mm -hmm. can't basically declare, declare bankruptcy anymore. That, that's not an option anymore. You know, so it's little things like that that are just going to just completely keep tilting the playing field more and more and more and more in the favor of the fat cats. So my suggestion to all of you is you better learn how to play their game. Because if you don't, you are a sucker. And you've got sucker written right across your forehead. And I hate to say it, but I actually think Bitcoin is a beautiful illustration of this. Um, you know, sadly, and you know, the worst part about this is it's actually stunningly cliche, uh, but you know, and I've been through these cycles now, I've been through a few of them, you know, the euphoria through this period couldn't talk smack about corn. And yet I even remember there's one student of mine that was on the site. He could not fathom that Bitcoin could actually come all the way right back down to about like 10% of its low. And when this high, and then when this happened, he was absolutely heartbroken. I mean, it turns out that he did learn how to trade at TRI, which was a fantastic uh, testament to him. 
And uh, in later crypto, the next bull crypto cycle, he made more money than he didn't know what to do with. <laughs> so that's good. But I remember through this, that guy was like suicidal. And yet the irony of it all is this so cliche. And I actually think, remember, I showed you that blog post there a moment ago. And uh, wow, sure, Brian is off on a tear here today. Eh? Uh, but I showed you this. And I actually think that this cycle is a carbon copy of that particular cycle. Again, this blog post, this blog post is free. It's absolutely free. Um, and yet, you know, I don't see anybody else doing this kind of research online. It, it baffles me. And I think it's simply because the 1% sees exactly what I do. And they don't want the public knowing this. So it's in the 1%'s interest. Try and keep Brian and as quiet as possible. But anyway, to hear it's here nor there. If anything, this is really, really lucky for all of you people. Um, learn this stuff. I mean, for God's sakes, learn this. Please, learn this. Well, ah, you guys are talking about Da Vinci over on, uh, on uh, YouTube there, eh? Da Vinci, yes, Da Vinci. And the funny thing is, is we even, and I don't know why we have this. It just kills me. But uh, if you go to join.therationalinvestor.com, we even had a uh, recent, uh, I think I did this uh, video interview with him back in like 2019 because Dav was one of our players uh, from back that cycle, right? This Dav, and the interesting thing is Dav came on the site and he learned, he even created a setup that I think we even still have on our free screeners. I mean, talk about a bonus. This is ridiculous. I don't know. I think you can get this with just the basic site membership. You see, I come on the site and all I do is I just click screeners, just like I clicked uh, the blog there. Uh, but this screeners page, there's Dav setup. This is the setup that he actually built as a student um, uh, on the site. And we love using it. We call it the Devo. Um, not quite sure why that's there. Uh, I think, sure, we have to fix this. Looks like it's slightly broken. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, anyway, so there, this is supposed to be Davo bullish, Davo bearish. How the fuck you got key reversal signals in here? That's supposed to be behind the paywall. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not quite sure why that shows there. Uh, maybe I should show this to uh, Seward. But anyway, um, point is, is that uh, Dav built this. And then actually what was really interesting was uh, Dav went off and started his own um, uh, Pandora's wallet. So Kevin, I guess you're a fan of Dav. Uh, is he still doing that Pandora's wallet? Is he? Well, that's good. That was a big to get off the ground where basically you could trade cryptocurrencies through his, his wallet. Um, this is not free. So uh, when you click on the screeners here, I don't some I don't know whether it's I I suppose it wouldn't be free but like the basic silver membership. So if you took the education program uh then uh then you should be able to see it. Uh but anyway, the point being uh and I don't really want to give this stuff away for free. So basic silver membership. If you buy the dashboard membership, then you get all my fancy schmancy indicators. And things like key reversals, which is kind of a shame because I've given this information out to people. And I wouldn't even be surprised if there's other people out in the universe that have blatantly copied this and they're selling it on their platforms and stuff now. But I've never seen anybody anywhere ever produce key reversal uh, signals to so the weekly B bullish key reversal signals. Uh, in fact, you know, the key reversal concept comes from my old VSC trading days. So nobody, you know, I, I never hear anybody on YouTube, but talk about it or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So just the point being that, yeah, I don't want to give this stuff away for free. I mean, fuck, I worked like 35 years in the industry. Uh, those are the kind of things that, no, I'm not giving away for free. Sorry. But like a guy like Dav, he was a site member and he actually had a really cool setup. Uh, and I even like making reference to it. In fact, I think there was even a Dav setup that even uh, fired recently um on uh i don't know whether it was bitcoin but i did see it i think it was on a few of the cryptocurrencies 
nice double bottoms coming in on like RSI, OBV, MACD, and Price. So it's really cool. Anyway, so just speaking to that person's uh, reference, there is Dav. He's a character. Uh, he had an interesting time at TRI. I think he was very unsure of himself, which makes perfect sense. Uh, he has a larger than life persona on social media. And so as a result, that's really backed him into a corner. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, and actually you all should learn from this. This should be a really, really good learning experience for all of you. Like everybody watching this video, what Dav went through is a really good lesson for all of us. So I don't, I don't know what the, his ultimate outcome was. Uh, and if I understand correctly, he's living in uh, the Middle East somewhere, living the high life, eating gold steaks and living the, uh, the good life. And congratulations to him. I don't have any ill feelings for him. The only thing I don't like, and this is what I mean, is a good lesson for you, is that because he had this larger than life persona, when the market actually was telling us it was getting ready to break down about a year or so ago, and actually, you can really see it on the weekly charts, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Um, you can see, obviously, I've had this conversation before. Uh, because he had this, like, larger-than-life persona, he, he had to constantly maintain that sort of, hey, we're all going to get rich, buy Bitcoin. Oh, we're all going to get rich, just buy, buy, buy. And, of course... Technical analysis, that's how that's half the, the, the issue why you do TA is that it was starting to spit out warning signs that actually, you know, investing your hard-earned money, investing your livelihood, investing your family's future, going and like taking out mortgages to buy Bitcoin and stuff. Once we get above this 4669 level, you're just asking for trouble. And then, of course, in the face of things like bearish momentum divergences in our indicators, I mean... If you respect TA, and of course, through this, the guys that are doing the billion dollar newsletters and have a gazillion, bazillion uh, followers, you know, the last thing in the world you want to tell them is, you know what, you're probably best just not to do anything. Do you see how many people are watching this video right now? I mean, that's a testament that I don't do the shill. And the irony of it all is that, you know, if let's go just for fun and let's do uh, Google searches for Bitcoin, you know, what is what's the public's interest in Bitcoin right now? Can I even get a, a video or an image of this? I do. Wait, is that what I do? What do I think, Chris? What do I do here? Trends, Google Trends. Uh, maybe I'll go Bit Bitcoin, something like that. Maybe it'll spit some. It's got to spell it back. Okay, there you are. See this? This Chris guy is actually pretty smart, you know. It's kind of all right. <laughs> there you go. There, there you go. There you go. See, look at that. Oh, there you go. Oh, what was that? Uh, oh, explain. And look how the internet has been so corrupted now, right? So, uh, oh, goodness. It's so sad the way the internet is gone, eh? It's kind of, uh, it makes a little part of me cry. All right. So I guess this kind of makes sense. But what I want to see is like, uh, uh, let's go past five years. There you go. So... The irony of it all is you can see how many people in the world could potentially buy your newsletter or take your course and all that kind of fun stuff. If you tell them up here, hey, yeah, buy Bitcoin, get involved in this space. You're going to get rich, man. <laughs> Versus the guy who says, okay, down here, you know what? It's time to start loading up on Bitcoin again. I mean, you can just see relative basis. There's me pounding the table and saying buy Bitcoin into the end of the year. Notice where's the end of the year? There it is there, right? This is when I put the tweets out and stuff. Do you have your skirt together? And who can tell me on YouTube without actually typing the words? You got to type in like an asterisk or something in one of the letters. 
What does skirt stand for? <laughs> and of course, nobody in the public is interested in Bitcoin right here. And, you know, the irony of it all is if you actually stepped in and bought here, you did pretty darn well. There you go. Thank you, people. <laughs> A couple of you play kidding me. Ah, Nuri. Hugs and kisses. I can't wait to get back to Europe with you guys. You know, actually, I was sitting watching. There's some really cool places coming up for sale in Portugal again. So I think they're getting uh, the real estate barons are getting a little desperate again. I, I was quite surprised uh, at some of the videos, uh, the places for sale. It's like, wow, you know, that's actually I could actually afford to buy a house. Imagine that. Like in Canada, I still have to double my net worth now to buy a respectable size house here where I live. I mean, it's just pathetic. And of course, I don't want to take out a mortgage because in essence, you are doubling the amount you're going to pay for the house. And half of that money is going right into these bankster cocksucker wallets. I mean, what a crime this society is. Anyway, so it's interesting how I can... There's some pretty nice places over there in Portugal I could actually go and just... Cash, write a check, done. Yeah, so yeah, maybe Portugal's back on the dock. And I know Sjord wants me to think about Portugal. Anyway. And of course, I've told you what uh, Canada is doing. Oh boy, what a mess. Okay, so where uh, somebody got me off on a tangent on uh, Da Vinci. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was probably painful for a lot of you. You know, there was one gentleman on the site when Da Vinci was on the site that he was not very complimentary of Mr. Da Vinci. And there are a few other people that were kind of like, yeah, and I, you know, this is the interesting thing, right? Where I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And I hope you guys give me the benefit of the doubt. So I do believe that there is a reason why I was brought into all of your lives. I mean, it's fascinating. We only have 50 people watching this video. And yet probably this is the only place where you're really going to get like sort of well, no, I won't go down that road. Anyway, so the point of the matter here is Dav was a student. Dav actually created setups and trading plans and stuff while he was at a student. And then, unfortunately, he got a little corrupted into the cycle. Uh, you know, uh, the billions of dollars and all that kind of stuff started uh, flowing in. And uh, he kind of lost his discipline there. And now because of that, I think he was a little bit embarrassed by all that. I don't think he really talks too much to the traders of the world anymore. Just, hey, I made a shitload of money on Bitcoin. And uh, also, too, I think he floated an altcoin and did pretty well on that. So, you know, he's richer than all of us put together. Congratulations, Dav. Way to go. But uh, I don't know whether I would really call him a trader anymore. That's That's probably not the right expression. He is a, you know, who he is in crypto. I mean, God, he was mining it at like a dollar or something. So now he's one of these guys. <laughs> so, but the irony of it all is that to actually be a really, really good trader, um, in a weird sort of way, you don't want to be like that. You got to, if anything, there's actually, you know, speaking of videos, um, uh, I, I don't have the link handy, so it would take me five minutes to find. There's one uh, guy on YouTube right now. He's just a young guy, and he's putting together the shorts. I even tweeted him out. And this guy, you can see, he's hungry. He's hungry. Uh, he might get a little greedy. He might get a little egotistical. Who knows? We'll see how it goes down the road. But you can see he's hungry, and he's probably going to be next generation killer traders. And I can see them on the site. You know, I, I can absolutely see them on the site as they're blossoming. Uh, you can see the traders coming along. You can see who's going to do really well at this game and who's going to, who's still floundering. And, you know, even somebody uh, posted in the lounge today that, hey, you know, this, this doesn't sound like professional trader talk. So please understand anybody that's in the lounge, it's just a public lounge. So we can have people that are 30 day trial people coming into the lounge. We can have, um, Level one students, we can have level two students, we can have level three students. Now we have a level four, way to go, Zach, talking, uh, teaching uh, our OGs how to spread trade options. Oh my goodness, so sexy. So uh, I can see who's going to be the next generation of killer traders, but it, don't come into the trading room lounge, right? The TRI lounge and, and expect that to be all TRI OGers. In a weird sort of way, I mean, full disclosure, 
Uh, most of our, like this is the member lounge. It's the lounge. <laughs> it's just supposed to be where you meet and greet and chat. And really what I would like is for new people to come in and cut their teeth, right? And you can see, uh, you know, if I can ever get around to it and stop talking about um, uh, fat cats and stuff. I actually looks to me like we've got bullish divs happening here in Bitcoin. So, you know, I put posts out like, you know, if you're a bear, maybe you should just be cooling your jets right now. And that's kind of, you know, what I'm thinking in the market. But I post just what I'm doing. And, you know, we have other site members. You know, the easy way to sort of discern whether uh, you're talking to a new person that really doesn't know what they're doing and uh, guys like uh, uh, 1075 is, of course, they have their veteran tags. So if you see a guy with a veteran tag, odds are, you know, they've gone through the education program with me. They have a pretty good head on their shoulders. Uh, and uh, I think they're, you know, they talk and act more like traders. But, you know, like I did see somebody here just uh, before I started up uh, this person here, you know, like uh, Mr. Super Jew. I don't know who Mr. Super Jew is. Uh, you know, they don't have any tags or anything by their name. But at the same time, too, you know, this is a lounge. This is just supposed to be, hey, we're shooting the shit, getting to know each other. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Hey, what do you think of this idea? What do you think of that idea? It's not the place to beat each other up. And if anything, what I've said repeatedly is if you start to show kind of crappy, poor behavior, then you will be just escorted off the site. And I'll give you a full refund. I don't care. It's no big deal to me. Um, and uh, hell, I even had somebody recently who took the education program. And I even said, look, show me the receipts. Show me you did everything in the course program. Obviously, you made it through level three. So show me you wrote all the final exams. If you can show me all that and you still don't think you got money, or value for the money you spent, then fine, I'll give you a refund. Um, so I think a lot of people are thinking that I'm actually using this to get rich. I am not. Hell, I, I bark at you guys about how I can't even buy a home in Lower Mainland here for my special needs son. That's not a guy talking, getting rich at this. If anything, this is where, you know, the old CME floor trader guys we're all pissed off at me because I'm well I'm going off on this stupid holier than thou bent and I'm going to change the world and make a positive difference and all that shit, right? <laughs> They're like, shut up, Brian. Just get back in the pits and make us money because you're at a prop for him, damn it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm on this uh, holy uh, quest. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um not quite sure how the hell I got off on all that, but uh, I hope you enjoyed the that was edutaining for all you guys. If you got any value out of that whole rant, please hit the like button, subscribe, you know, hit, ring the little bell and stuff. We even give you the little sort of in video notices, right? Hit all this stuff, right? All these uh, buttons and stuff, and you know, just help uh, your fellow man. If you think that that rant was worth somebody else hearing. The only way that we can get Google and their algorithm to sort of promote this video is if you guys like comment and, and hit the like button and all that kind of fun stuff. I appreciate it. It just, uh, it, I'm trying to make a positive difference in this world. I really don't even have to be doing these Sunday shows. Nobody's paying me to do this. We have no corporate sponsorship. Um, you know, we're I'm here to make a positive difference. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, enough of that. Okay, so uh, let's go take a look at what the heck, you know, and hopefully Chris can make like a little note uh, with the chapters and stuff on um, on um, on the Google videos and stuff. Okay, Brian starts the uh, video off with a rant about the uh, 1%, a rant about your generational cycles, a rant about this, rant about that. And at this point, beep, he actually gets to what he's supposed to be talking about. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, first and foremost, I always like to start um, the week off with just a review of what the heck Bitcoin's doing. So, and I think it behooves all of you uh, to always sort of, and, you know, interestingly enough, if we want to juxtapose, hey, look at that, Joshua tipped me a big two bucks. Woohoo! Thanks, man. Um, I think it always behooves us to start off every time we pull up any chart and we're thinking about spending our hard-earned money to pull up the weekly chart and then drill down. 
So we started this weekly chart. Um, interestingly enough, we're down into reload zones. So uh, you can see how the moving averages turn back up. And I've told you about this, you know, off our dashboards. Uh, where's the best place to show you this? Oh, we had it over here. Oh, and by the way, too, you can always follow me. See our investor, Canadian Rational Investor. So when I first set this up, I used to have a, um, a um, almost a fight with a guy down in Minnesota who called himself the Rational Investor down there, and he threatened to sue me, so I had to call myself CR Investor. <laughs> so Canadian Rational Investor. So if you're wondering what the hell CR Investor stands for, that's what it stands for. Also, too, uh, we set up this uh, awesome, uh, although I don't know how to do this, uh, we set up this awesome um, um, pay, uh, tweet account, social media account, TRIPMA, and this is run by TRI, and I think it's in your best interest to uh, like and follow this as well if you do the Twitter thing, TR, at TRI underscore PMA. This is where Josh just, he brings ridiculous value. The value that, again, you know, he runs the blog and that's this. And things like TRI PMA um, uh, feed, I mean, there's no better resource out there for you to track, you know, well, I want to learn how to become a better trader. I mean, Josh does just some absolute incredible work. I also find it a little disappointing that you can see Alan is trying desperately to undermine us here. And I think that's because I don't really like the idea of paying him a subscription to use this social media. I have suggested to the team, and of course all of you people uh, you know, that are on the team, you wanna go and get the blue check mark for this account, it's fine by me, totally fine. You know, I don't really wanna do it for my own personal account, uh, but you can see clearly uh, the algorithms at work are trying to make our life a little bit more difficult. But anyway, regardless, if you do the Twitter thing, I would strongly suggest that you follow those two. And this is a fun uh, thread. I just say what's on my mind. Sometimes very politically incorrect, just a trader dude, middle-aged, fat, balding white man who's obviously extremely bitter. <laughs> so there you go. Merry Christmas. Um, and if you want to, you know, I think I even have, um, TRI has a social media Facebook, uh, page. Um, this is my personal page, although I have no idea how to do this. I don't really use Facebook that much. Uh, I wanted to just go to my profile, but there it is. And anytime I'm going to, you can see there's my stepmother. I wished her a uh, happy mother's day here. First thing this morning. But if you if I'm ever going to post anything sort of personal or you know about Liam or anything, you want to get to know Liam a little bit better. Uh, I haven't really done much lately. Liam's been not interested in throwing rocks in the water at all lately. But you know maybe with the weather changing, he might feel a little bit better. But anyway, uh, if I ever and you want to get to know sort of the more personal side of Brian, this is my son. Uh, he is low functioning autistic. Uh, beautiful boy. And of course, as soon as I'm done with all of you guys, this is exactly where I go and I spend the rest of my afternoon because he's really my real job, right? So um, anyway, we, we often go and visit mummy uh, at the cemetery. So anyway. Um, okay. So, you know, that's I, like I've told all of you guys, I'm an open book, right? So uh, I, sometimes I'm, well, maybe a little too open, but anyway. Um, okay, so where was I? Uh, okay, so back to sort of what I like to do here for this uh, broiler chicken show. Um, where did that Twitter page go? Did I just kill it? Uh, maybe it was in here. Uh, oh, that's off of the blog. Um, okay, uh, back here. So uh, every week, I like to just take a good look at uh, the old Bitcoin. Uh, whoops, that's uh, Josh. Oh, that's why, because I couldn't find it because they did this to us. Let's see if, uh, anyway, there it is. Uh, all right, so weekly basis basically said the brick wall of support was that indeed that. And I think two weeks ago, I laid out there were like five different reasons in this every single Sunday. I do this uh, summary of Bitcoin, which I think is extremely valuable. Just keep it simple, stupid for you through the week. 
Um, so I think it was like two or three weeks ago I posted, uh, and uh, we'll pull up the real time chart just so you can see what I'm talking about. That uh, we had uh, basically this head and shoulders uh, breakout level. We had the 13 EMA, we had the 200 SMA, we had the 38.2. And also, too, off of lower time frames, uh, if we drill down to, say, like the daily basis, actually, I think the four hour, you see it best. We had this AB equals CD level, and we had some interesting fog and bomb levels uh, that we slammed into. Um, and we also had like a 38.2. Uh, remember, I had said that uh, a few minutes ago off of that entire range there. So we had a whole bunch of reasons to look for the market to sort of find a bit of support in there. So just off of the weekly chart, as you can see here, I it doesn't surprise me that we stopped going down where we did. And then also too, um, if we, uh, well, let's, uh, I'll finish off this weekly thought, then we'll go down to lower time frames. So uh, said here, uh, brick wall of support was indeed that. It was the support line. Price bounced smartly off indicated support levels. Like I said, moving averages. Uh, we didn't even get down to this neckline level. 38.2, some fog and bomb levels as well, and a lower time frame bear ABCD. Seasonal weakness ought to be expected through the end of June. And I think that's important, especially for a lot of sort of new people to trading to really understand. Oh, thank you, Nore. Wow, look at that. Nore, Coke, Kevin. Wow, all of you guys. Thank you. Wow, there, that's an awful bunch of generosity from you guys. Thank you very much, guys. Um, so I don't think it should have surprised anybody that you know Bitcoin didn't just absolutely fall out of bed. Uh, having said that, uh, I think probably now we have to sort of try and ask ourselves, well, what, what was driving that sort of down push? And I thought it was interesting that number one, you know, sell in May and walk away, Brian's birthday. And actually, I think you see this all in the next chart. Uh, I don't think there was enough of it, like the actual dump into the profit taking levels just so happened to come in right on the New York close into Friday, that dump right there. And remember, we, you know, the FUMC, FOMC has a nasty habit of stopping market rallies. And I think on balance, it's sort of like, by the rumor, hey, the Fed's going to stop raising interest rates, then no, nope, Fed's not going to stop raising interest rates. Just sell the news. Okay, maybe this time, Fed's going to stop raising interest rates. Nope, Fed's still raising interest rates, <laughs> jerks. Okay, now this time, Fed's going to stop raising interest rates. And interesting how basically the market was exactly the same level as it was the previous FOMC. I don't think that was an accident. No, turns out they're not going to stop raising interest rates. Down goes price. So I think there's a buy the rumor, sell the news. Then also, too, and this is really cool, uh, we have a site uh, member, Cole. And we have another site member, uh, well, actually a few site members who are into astrology uh, and astrological events. And of course, we have this lunar eclipse. And if you go back and look how Bitcoin and crypto acts around these lunar eclipse, not a big surprise, ran into a bit of weakness following that event. And then there's sort of icing on the cake, of course, Brian's birthday. <laughs> I don't think there really is anything around Brian's birthday. It's more like, well, you know, it's the middle of May. It's what are we supposed to do in May? Would it surprise us if we happen to see a weak market state through this event window? Not really. Sure enough, this day is just like any other day. So I don't think Brian's birthday is the reason, but I definitely think that it's a marker, you know, and just hopefully you guys remember this for the rest of your lives. Oh, shit, it's that Beamish's guy's birthday. We probably should think that risk is going to kind of get in trouble. And actually an interesting sort of uh, image of risk getting into trouble is the ultimate sort of risk off bet. Just I'm going to sell everything that's risky and I'm just going to go park my money in U.S. Treasuries or and now they don't even want to buy U.S. Treasuries. It's U.S. T-bills and that's it. Nothing else. There's no fucking way you're going to get me to buy a long bond. 
Did you just see what happened to those regional banks that went and bought Granny? Granny says, oh, invest, 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 invest. So they go and invest, 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 and they get absolutely destroyed. Oh, thanks, Granny. Appreciate it. But this is now the U.S. dollar index. And the only reason why this thing would be moving up, if remember, it's just a basket of other in, uh, currency proxies. So if the basket of other in, uh, proxies is going uh, up in value, then that must mean the basket itself is going down. I think that makes sense. And I think a lot of it is because Fed's basically said, look, at we're not done raising rates. Get used to it. And the data coming out now is a little scary. Um, <laughs> you signed up for the level one on the eclipse. Well, that, hopefully that's a good thing. <laughs> now, you have to understand, Mr. Scotch guy. What's your name? Scotch Egg. All right. Scotch Egg. Interesting name. Hey, I remember JoJo's family. They used to always eat Scotch eggs. I think that's right. And blood pudding. Mm, yum. Uh, Adam. Holy jeez, look at Adam. Thank you very much, sir. Gee. He's, uh, he's representing the Americans. So German, uh, Norway's the Euro. That's kind of funny. Coke must be over in Euro. Kevin's over in Euro. Joshua. <laughs> Joshua's an American. And notice that these are the woke Californians. Notice we don't have anybody from the East Coast for pre presenting here. <laughs> They're still skeptical of me. <laughs> Coke is Estonia. Oh, interesting. Oh, Estonia. All right, well, let's get Let's finish off with this. So, you know, uh, Mr. Estonia, if this thing is pointing up, then what does that mean uh, the euro currency must be doing? Oh, Kevin's from Belgium. Oh, cool. Actually, you're just down the road. You should go visit Sjord. Sjord's uh, pretty much a next door neighbor, dude. And actually, he's seen quite a few TRIers over the years. Uh, so yeah, so you know, thirty-five percent of this is uh, is um, the euro. So that must mean the euro is kind of in trouble. And uh, I don't know. We could probably look at the euro. That would be over here. Let's uh, let's see what these. Oh no, that's Bitcoin. Uh, let's see what is the euro. Nope. Uh, well, we could look out there, but let's keep it simple. Over here, what do these European currencies look like? Here they are. And your, yep, these are the commodities, commodity currencies. Let's go. Uh, where the hell is the euro? There. Oh, it's right there. Duh. Okay, so these are the big boys. Uh, there is your euro. Let's see what it looks like on like a weekly basis. Boom. Yeah, so I guess the market, this must be a wicked divergence here, right? Oh, oh darn. Can't see that. Okay, now I'm just wasting everybody's time. Let's go over here and then let's go E6 and then we'll go over here. Well, yeah, that's a bit bearish. So there's your US dollar strength. It's really euro weakness. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think the Japanese yen looks even worse, but I'm not positive on that. Anyway, here is uh, that's lower time frame. Let's see if we can Brian can get his act together. All right, there is the daily chart. Uh oh. So who can tell me what are you supposed to think if you ever see uh, Christine Lagarde smiling at you? Uh oh, she's getting ready to take your pants off. What? Oh, Jesus, H. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I gotta get in trouble if I talk like that. But anyway, uh, can you see Lagarde? What do you think Christine is doing right now? Actually, it's interesting because I just called another Christine today, but uh, she's not in the banking industry. Anyway, what do you think? What are we supposed to think if we ever see the market smiling at us? So there you go. There's some big fat alpha for you, and you didn't have to pay a damn penny for it. Look at that. Nasty. Where are all those, uh, you know, uh, um, social media uh, aficionados? Why, have you heard them barking about going uh, short the euro lately? There's a nice uh, candlestick engulfing bar there, too, that uh, confirmed on that double top breakdown. There's also, this is also a smile within a smile. Jesus, very, very bearish action. So this is a risk on bet.
And what do you think? Is risk on going up or down? <laughs> you paid 10000 for somebody's program? What the hell are you talking about there, Coke? I heard life is kind of hard in Italy. Is it true uh, hard to find a job? I would imagine life in Italy. And like I said to you, Coke, earlier, right? The uh, the people in Portugal, they're kind of panicking. There's some really interesting deals coming out on the market there. And of course, sadly, you know, Brian's a cheap ass, right? So the only time I get interested is when I see people panicking. In fact, I saw there's a sailboat, and I was seriously thinking about buying this, that typically goes for about 150 to 200,000. And there's a total panic seller, and they dropped the price from 150 down to 110,000. I was just like, oh my God, I got to pull the trigger. Then the guy, I sent an email and the guy goes, oh, sorry, it's under contract. Somebody else beat me to it. Fuckers. It was a sweet, sweet ride. Chris, you and I, we could have lived pretty damn comfortably on that damn thing if I had gone there. <laughs> then I would, I would like sail it over to Spain and just park it on the shore there on Mallorca, right? I'll park it just offshore like a moor. And it, they're probably the mooring would be as much rent as I pay now here for this apartment. <laughs> anyway, you can see when I when I look over there, it means I'm talking to Chris. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I get the impression the Europeans are in a little bit of trouble. All right, so back to our story, once upon a time. And see, I've made the argument that the US actually raising interest rates, Europe could should, could be in a bit of trouble here. Uh, and I actually think it's the world economy that's in more trouble than the American economy. I actually think the Americans, and to a certain lesser degree, the Canadians, more the Mexicans. I think the Mexicans, met, you know, fucking Billy Gates there went long Mexico through the sickness. Man, that was a hell of a trade. Be interesting to see what that looks like. Uh, what was it? What's the Mexico fund look like these days? So the next time Billy Gates tells you he's going to go and buy a big whack of something, I don't know, should we listen to him? I mean, it, maybe just go buy a call or something. So this is the Mexican fund. Actually, it looks like maybe it's topping out a bit here. Yeah, so uh, there is the sickness. And I remember specifically Billy said that he was expecting uh, China basically to collapse and all of the business to leave China and to sort of relocate back to North America. And he was gonna go tits deep into Mexico. So what do you think? Was that a pretty good trade? I hate to say it, but I think it was. And also too, I hate to say it, does this not look like an M? We're probably gonna find that he changed his mind now and he's actually gonna be selling <laughs> bastard. But the point here is that literally all of you could do this. There's no reason why any of you couldn't. You know, when you, uh, he actually went on uh, public broadcast and he was talking about, remember his quote to dead bodies in the street? Uh, thank you, Mr. Gates, for injecting fear into the marketplace. And that's exactly what he wanted to do. Um, and uh, of course, he said that he was buying Mexico. So he did tell you that he was going long this down here. Um, you know, so I suppose... You call him a jerk for injecting a whole bunch of stress into people's lives. Uh, but, you know, he did tell you that he was buying this, so you could have just ridden his coattails. Anyway, that's another conversation for another day. So point of the matter here is now. I'd actually make the argument it looks like the euro's in a bit of trouble here. Um, and, of course, there's the U.S. dollar. Interesting on a weekly basis, though. Eh, you know, you might still see some back and forth here. Also, too, I would say, remember we talked about this earlier, if the U.S. does go into default, then, of course, all of these sort of, you know, Fugazi, because keep in mind, all like the euro, the Japanese yen, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, um, I don't know, they've gotten rid of a lot of them, eh? But a lot of these Fugazi currencies, they're worthless. The only worth they have is what's relative to the U.S. dollar. And if they continue the trading pair status, you might find down the road things get so bad that a lot of these currencies say, you know what, we're going back to the gold standard. I don't know. We'll see. 
I think the Swiss tried to do that. And interestingly enough, um, I think the Swiss actually, they didn't really do themselves any favors. You know, look at this. Ironically enough, if we go into some sort of massive deflationary spiral, you might find that the gold price comes off and the Swiss franc price comes off as well. You know, and if the Americans say, hey, we're still willing to pay 5 10%, uh, to hold our paper, everybody goes piling into the U.S. dollar like they did in 1980, and it's that scenario all over again. The world goes into massive recession, and ironically enough, I don't think it's the Americans, you know. And because of that, the data will come out in the states that man, everything's fine. So that means the one percent who own the media are going to be dominating the airwaves. Eh, everything's fine. And Portuguese real estate goes on sale again. Spanish real estate goes on sale again. The euro goes on sale again. You know, I, I heard there's like empty houses now in Japan. You can actually just go and you can buy ho empty houses in Tokyo now, if I'm not mistaken. I watched a video recently about how a Western guy went and bought like a full house in Tokyo because it was just abandoned. Nobody lived in it for like 10 years. Because they, the Japanese have this interesting thing, and I think the Chinese too. They do not like moving into a house where somebody else has uh, died. So yeah. Anyway. Okay. So back to Bitcoin. So reminded me. Somebody says, uh, "Coke, uh, hey, aren't we supposed to be talking about Bitcoin?" <laughs> anyway. So I think we banged into a whole bunch of support here. Usually on first blush, this support holds, and I think that's exactly what's going on now. Um, next tweet, uh, was that in the food chain was all about, uh, monthly or excuse me, uh, medium term. And again, keep in mind U S dollar index, this is a risk off bet. It's pointing up. So that's sort of more sort of anecdotal evidence that the market doesn't really want to be in risk right now. It actually wants to be out of risk right now. And I know you guys love, uh, your Bitcoin, but I just like gold, just like the stock market, the, those are all risk on bets. And if risk needs to come off, and if the market wants to go into T-bills for the next six, eight months, because we're going into recession or something like that, then all of these prices fall. And if anything, it's good that that happens because as this weekly chart points out, we doubled in price. Should we not maybe back up and clean price up a little bit here? Technically make things look a little bit more attractive. You know, on the daily chart, if we zoom in now, now we'll talk dailies. We had a megaphone top that was working. And the question was, when the hell is this damn thing going to resolve? So you, I think you can actually make the argument that the megaphone has now been lost. And it'll be interesting to see whatever kind of dead cap bounce, counter trend rally we can engineer here. Can they, you might just find that they rally it right back up and kiss the megaphone from the other side. Wouldn't be, it wouldn't shock me one bit. So what I've said here is that now we have an M top working. In fact, we have two M tops working here now. I think we have a valid downtrend line based on market structure. I actually did a parallel line to this line in the lounge earlier today. And somebody was like, well, isn't this sort of more valid market structure trend line? And actually they were right. I do think that the parallel line is more relevant. You might find that we rally notice there's a huge upward pointing channel here. And the dotted line that you see on the screen is the midpoint of that channel. Sorry if the microphone's far away. I'm just realizing that's pretty far away now. Anyway, so notice the dotted line here. I think you could very easily see a counter trend rally right back up into that dotted line. And then also notice too, hey, look at that, reload zone. I'm not allowed to short unless we are in reload short zone, especially off like lower time frames. I did strap on this short here as a demo for site members. 
But try and understand, this is a setup that I've been barking about for a while. This is not really trading the megaphone. This is trading this uh, three-step setup. And I'm just going to sit in this setup and follow it verbatim. Because I wanted to be a demonstrator of best practices for you guys. And really, the way I'm looking at this right now, uh, let's see, yeah is uh three step setup right do we have trade location we banged into a chaos level we also had a b c d levels we also had some lower time bullish bot levels um we then look down at our indicators so we had trade location we look down at our indicators and you see we have a double divergence going here so from this peak that peak that's a big divergence that's that uh, but we also have this one boom boom that um so we got a lot of indicator reasons to be uh, cautious here. Uh, we also uh, have two market structure M's working. And this second market structure M, this was a tag of the clothesline level. And I wanted to demonstrate how that works. So in essence, on the site, I basically work the order at the level. And you can see there I am short about an eighth of a coin on this stamp uh, from that level. Market worked its way down. And everybody's like, whoa, you're so smart, Brian. Oh, look at you, look at you. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen here. I really don't. Uh, this short is working away, though. And based on our Foggenbaum principle, especially this big honking M, I do feel very comfortable that we probably need to trade down to this 2.618. And you notice that 2.618 level just so happens to be almost exactly two to one off of shorting this big fat M top and risking the new highs. So that's the trade setup. Right now, the rule that I have is if 50% of this move is realized, you move your stop to scratch. If we come down and tag this level, I think I'm actually gonna only sell half of this position but I have the, all of it for sale at this 2.618. Uh, if we just completely puke out here, I'll just walk away. But if we slowly walk our way down and the move looks very orderly, I might just sell half, put the stop at scratch after we've hit the 50% level and just let this thing work and see what the hell happens. Uh, so uh, long and short of it here is we'll let some of it go there at 22 and change. And then if the market completely pukes out, we'll cover the whole thing on a test to new lows. But I wouldn't be surprised if that comes like maybe in like September, long, long way down the road. There's no hurry on this, but I think it's a really, really good demonstration of trade location, indicator confirmation, price structure, go. Strap it on, two to ones, move your stop to scratch at appropriate levels, live with the results. So that's what this trade is. Just as simple as that. Well, we'll see what happens. Um, so back to our daily chart um, off of this perspective. There are those tops. There's that 2.618. There's the two to ones, blah, blah, blah. I still like the idea that this is a megaphone, which might mean that we could have a counter trend rally right back up into this reload short zone. So if we look down at the four hour chart, then what I basically said was in the uh, social media message, thank you, sir. All right, this we're right on course here actually I have, I have no beverage either boo his his boo um if we drill down to the lower time frame actually you know what why don't we take a minute break i'm gonna fill my coffee up because i hate being parched talking to you so i will be right back maybe you can play some let's all go to the lobby let's all go to the lobby Let's all go to the lobby and get something to drink, right? <laughs> something like that. I'll be right back. <laughs>
Let's all go to the lobby. All right, Let's all go to the lobby. Is it too long? Ugh. Let's see. Do I make it back on screen? Did I totally screw this up? Well, that's not bad. Yeah, just by the top of my head, though, is uh, off screen. I wonder how I did that. All right. It looks like I'm okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So continuing the story. Um, message off the daily, right? Trend line, megaphone top, trend line lost. Shorts off market structure M's now dominant. And the fact that there are two M's working there, oh boy, that's a lot of overhead resistance. Targets, 2.618, uh, midpoint of the megaphone. I think it makes perfect sense that we come down and play with this level here. And as I said, if we just puke out, then I'll just blow the whole position out. Believe it or not, I'm actually liking the idea that if we do get a counter trend rally, and I think, you know, there's going to be some sort of capitulation low, and I think we might have hit it. We might play around with this low, because keep in mind, you know, there's a bunch of easy liquidity down against that low that you might find that the New York guys, as soon as they come back from uh, the break on the weekend, boom, they go right after you and uh, run after those stops there. Also, too, look left. You can see next key support line is actually right down here. All right, that's the last time on this daily chart you actually had a major pivot low. So if there was a low to be looked for here, like panic dumps, get, you know, dump everything against these lows is where I would be thinking. So be careful here, but we'll talk about that when we get to the four hour chart. What I would just simply say here is a counter trend rally back up into this level here, up top here, this reload short zone. I, I would actually have not a problem if I got a beautiful little M up here actually adding to this short trade, believe it or not, call me crazy. Um, and also too, keep in mind that usually what happens is, of course, you've seen this repeatedly, the market loves to rally into the FUMC. But then once we're on the other side of it, the market likes to dump, dump, dump. And the interesting thing is, you don't know, these are mild dumps. And back here, when we were actually in a down market, oh boy, the dumps were ugly. So FUMC post FUMC dumps make perfect sense to me. So what I'm actually thinking here is they could walk this market up. I don't know how high they can take this here. Nobody does, of course, right? We have this beautiful wick right in here. And this was quite a doji on the daily basis. Uh, excuse me, on like a four hour basis. Mm, no, no, it, it was a doji on the daily basis. <laughs> it was a triangle, a diamond. Uh, on the lower time frames, four hours, three hours. So I suppose we'll see that in a minute. So what I see here is there's a whole bunch of trap bulls. I don't know whether you can see that or not. Actually, maybe if we go to the daily chart, you can see that. Um, right here, there are a ton of trap bulls. Right through this wick right here. And by the way, you know, and of course you can always make a fun short out of this, Part two, the top part of this doji candle, this is what's called a doji. The top part, this is called a wick that's above the body. The part that's below the body, YouTube, please learn this because it's so embarrassing. You guys coming out as technical analyst experts and trading experts and you call this a wick. This is not a wick. This is what's called a tail. <laughs> is that is that uh, condescending or too condescending for our YouTube short, baby? <laughs> but it drives it drives me crazy as an old old timer in the market when YouTube and and they're like, you know, use my indicator, you'll make a million dollars. Just buy in this wick, and it's like, oh, you're like literally taking your zipper down as you're talking, <laughs> just showing how much of a noob you are. It drives me crazy. And the irony of it all is the public just eats it up. They don't understand that they're completely wrong. Anyway, who blah, blah, blah. So, you know, th what's this candle? You can see, look at the size of this tail. It's huge. And you might even call that a bit of a hammer. 
where you got a body right up here and a trade through the top of the hammer candle is actually a bit of a buy signal. So point of the matter here is that uh, this doji was actually quite a battle, right? And if you look at it on the lower time frames, that's what that image is. There's the doji. And what's fascinating is, can you see, and look at, uh, that's a pretty good time to short trade there, right? So I did uh, work a sell order at a desired level, and you can see I got filled right in that. Um, double top right at the top of that doji, and then we just slam down. So theoretically, according to technical analysis modules written whatever a million years ago, uh, if we lose that doji low, then you should replicate, and also too, it's a diamond, you should actually replicate the size of the diamond, right? That's what this is down below the range. It's it's just TA 101. So it was interesting how we dumped and then we actually created like a bullish divergence uh, on this particular dump, right? And this was the FUD about Binance leaving the Canadian stock market uh, or, you know, Binance not leaving the Canadian market, get rid of this stock reference. <laughs> they, they don't care about stocks. Uh, and then an email went out and all that. And I think the market was expecting some sort of negative FUD. And then the market went, that's what the FUD was? Oh, fine. Screw it. We're heading back up, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But as a technician, you should have seen this bullish divergence here. Uh, that was confirmed basically right in here. And of course, take the program if you want to learn what a bullish divergence is and what is the difference between potential and confirmed. Uh, but the point here is that at this point right here, whatever this down push was, we actually have an expression on this site that if, you, if you're a bear and you see a uh, bullish divergence, you must do this. So anybody on YouTube, what am I making reference to there? What do you think that is? Maybe fill in the chat with your response, maybe even put in a comment. What do you think Brian is doing on the lower time frame basis now with Bitcoin and shorts? All right. And so thank you, uh, Nore. Thank you, uh, Coke. Looks like you guys nailed it. Good job. So until we start seeing confirmed bearish divergence, now remember, I don't really like to talk to you guys on these 30 minute charts. So let's get off of this chart. Let's go to maybe back to the four hour chart. And actually you can see the bull div a little bit clearer here. So there is the bullish divergence. And this is what I posted uh, earlier on, uh, on Twitter. Because I just basically said that, uh, we drill down now to the, uh, well, <clears throat> finish off the daily thought. I actually like the idea of the market counter trend rallying because that was a pretty big dump. And frankly speaking, I think the Fed was a bit silly there. Or I mean, the FUD, <laughs> not Fed. The FUD was a bit silly around Canada because ironically enough, I don't know whether you're aware, Canada represents about three, maybe 4% of the world's uh, equity. <laughs> so yes, the Canadians sure think highly of themselves, but with actual purchasing power, I don't really think that what happens in Canada makes a rat's ass a difference in the world. But you, know, but you ever say that to, it's so funny. If you go down into the States and you know, talking to Chris, Chris is our show director here. Chris, before you knew me, did you ever really interact or even know anything about Canada? Did Canada even exist in your world? Not really. I think you're the first Canadian I've actually had a conversation with. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, it's so funny. How, and you go to like Toronto or Ottawa or something like that, and they just think that they it the world shines out of their butts. You go down even just like 10, 20 miles south of the border. And it's like, Canada? I've heard of that place. Where is that up near the North Pole? <laughs> it's remarkable. <laughs> so anyway, that's here nor there. Uh, point here is that I don't think that what happens in Canada, I don't think the market really cares. It was just looking for an excuse to dump. And I think that was the fundamental FUD that caused, uh, was sort of the catalyst of the, of the dump. And then notice, as soon as New York was done for the week, everybody, you know, all the stock trading, all that, every, all the selling just stopped, right? So anyway, if we drill now, and then let's see, let's say, so I said, 
there's no way I can't turn bullish. I just cannot be a bull, a bull until we actually W out now on the other side of this trend line. But what I could very easily see happen is the market counter trends rally. This is a V bottom. We all know V bottoms need to be tested. We all know wicks and tails like to be eaten. You see these wicks, or ooh, ah, you see these tails down here, nom, nom, nom. They all got eaten up by these candles. So my hunch is we'll be back. But I think the market just ran out of sellers there, to be honest with you. Uh, and keep in mind, I've said repeatedly, and I'll just keep saying it, that I think pullbacks in this space are buying opportunities. You can see where I want to buy them. Like I'd be willing to start investing again in Bitcoin down here, let's say below 20 Gs. Ideally, I'd actually like to see it below the old lows there. Just go wash those lows in some sort of great panic. And that would be absolutely perfect trade location. But in the, in the time being, I could actually justify stepping in on the buy side, my manual value-based kind of investing, uh, if we did stab down into this reload zone. But you know how Brian thinks. So the point here is I cannot get bullish again until we actually get a W on the other side of this trend line. This trend line is now validated to me. We've lost the megaphone. And for me to actually get bullish again, I'm going to need to see the break of the trend line. Then I need to see a W come in on the other side of the trend line and then hopefully all of you are reading my mind. If I had this low, market rallied, came back, made a second low, rallied, came back, made a third higher low, i.e. made a W on the other side of this trend line. What do you think? What kind of setup do you think Brian's thinking? <laughs> Chris knows the answer. That's good to know. Uh, B, do you know the answer? Although I have no idea what B is doing here. He's, B is either a male or a female. I have no idea. Um, but uh, B is here in the hangout with us. And uh, uh, there we go. I was hoping for you to rap would be of being a great Mother's Day gift. <laughs> uh, you think we're ever going to see 20G Bitcoin ever again? I absolutely do. But, you know, that's just my opinion. It doesn't mean anything. Good, Kat. Good, Kat. You're relatively new to the crew, too. So good job. Um, and Nore, my German bodybuilder. Yes, good job. Anyway, so I could see, I mean, remember, my job as a trader is not to predict what's going to happen in the market, because frankly speaking, none of us are very good at it. We're almost always wrong. What I'm just going to do is I'm just going to react to what actually happens. So uh, as it stands right now, I actually have M market structure top in place. So I have to be bearish. I have no choice. Counter trend rallies are shorting windows until I actually start to see W's come in. And for me, old timer, I got to see a W on the other side of this trend line, which means we might have quite a playground in here. You might get, I mean, hell, you could have in the next couple of weeks here, you could have Bitcoin easily rally $3,000 a coin. And I'm still going to consider that a counter trend rally into a shorting window. So please understand that people. And then of course, heading into FUMC, might be interesting to see if there's any celestial events around the middle of June. I would be looking for some sort of top. Now, maybe we work our way lower and the counter trend rally comes in here. I don't know. You know where I'm going to take profits on these shorts. But I could very easily see this was some sort of panic low and we counter trend rally back into reload short zones, setting up yet another shorting window. Totally plausible on my uh, thinking. And why would I say that? Well, if we look at the lower time frame. And this is where I'll finish off this analysis and hopefully I have enough time to jump over to the questions. What I basically said here, of course, you know, we're all supposed to, you all know what we're supposed to think if we ever see the market smiling at us, right? Right, right. And I, you know, hopefully I've beaten this into the ground and that all of you watching this, you go, oh yeah, I gotta hear you say that all the time. 
This was a fun study I did off of the four hours where I just threw on 45 degree angles and then just see whether I get the, the actual scale correct. I drew them off of the peaks and then I also drew them off of the troughs at the same time and just asked where they intersected at a perfect right angle. Because at a perfect right angle, then I know I have sort of my charts squared. So I actually think also too, that we're sort of playing diamond patterns here. So you notice, you can't really see it here, but basically I said, you know, bear trend, right? We're all, we all know what we're supposed to think if we see bearish market structure. And if you don't, maybe I'll write this down, right? Um, but at the same time too, we had interesting little foggy boggies off of this M. We slammed down. Notice market didn't really respect, respect 2.618, but it sure did respect 4.669. And then notice we counter trend rallied right back to 2.618 and then rolled over hard and rejected that test. And in essence, look where we stopped, right at this 877. Bang, ouch, right on the nose. Also, too, notice that that was a AB equals CD. That can't be an accident that we stopped right at that level. Now, this is exact. I don't think so, but awfully close. Maybe, we, you know, I wouldn't be surprised because keep in mind, and, you know, let's see if you guys can finish this sentence. What are we supposed to think if you ever see the market make a V bottom? What do we say about wicks and tails? And by the way, YouTube and social media, this is a tail, not a wick. <laughs> what are we supposed to think? Thank you, Nore. Oh, you're so awesome. So at some point, I do think that they're going to come after this low. I really do. Now, they might rally it up, and then them coming after the low is some horrific dump. And, you know, the candle body lows for trade location, those people that are hunting entries down here, maybe you got a nice, beautiful bear, uh, bullish div that sets up down here. Then a nice little W comes in. You can kind of see, you know, maybe this will be a reload zone of a range. You can see that this tail is potentially setting up a trade location going forward. But in the short term, this move to the downside looked like it was done. And also, too, what was interesting, I don't have it here, but Julian was posting on the site that he had a trend channel that actually banged right into a channel upline. Uh, and he was kind of like, eh, it looks like this is probably done, which uh, I thought was an excellent observation on his part. And of course, all this stuff is posted in the lounge. So remember, we're just open books. We're trying to help people here. So you can use this information. If it helps you, awesome. If it doesn't, uh, sorry. It's just, it's just Brian's opinion, what he's looking at. Um, so also notice too, and I do see this happens a lot, is the market will repeatedly set up the same level over and over and over as an acceptable trade location. So these are like big fat fibs or Brian's favorite fib or Brian's big fat fanny or whatever the hell you want to call it. But these are like my awesome, sexy, man, I make a lot of money if I can force myself just to concentrate on taking trades at appropriate trade locations, Brian's favorite fib. And notice how they're all clustered around, you know, the short level from this move here, that's only like what? three four hundred dollars away from where the acceptable level is to short now even though the damn price dumped like what five thousand bucks <laughs> and notice this same short level so you know we might get a violent counter trend rally right back up into this reload short zone you know red boxes bffs all that kind of fun talk Wash these highs as a liquidity pool. Nice stop run against these highs. I could easily see this. So I'm not predicting that that's what's going to happen, but I could very easily see it happen. And then also too, remember like we said earlier, if I am a bear and I see a big fat bullish divergence, maybe I better just cool my jets. And so sure enough, you can see 
big, fat, bullish divergence that's confirmed. This doesn't necessarily mean set up a trade, but if you got a good looking W in here with the market pointing bullishly like this, I don't mind that as a trade setup. You just got to understand that you're taking a long trade in the face of a bear market. And I don't like to do those trades. I would much rather me personally let this move play out. I think on a lower time basis, you know, like 30 minute chart, there's actually a bull ABCD that in the near term wants to take us up into, oh, what a surprise, WD GAN's 50% rule, where markets are supposed to retrace. And also, too, we got a whole bunch of trap bulls here that would absolutely love to get released. Uh, will the market release them? There's also some trap bulls up in here as well. Uh, and then, like I said, uh, mind you, you don't see it here, but I think this was that big uh, diamond pattern, which is uh, this pattern. Be interesting to see whether they go after this liquidity pool right top up here. They might. I'm in no hurry to touch this whatsoever. No hurry at all. And what's interesting is sort of Sunday is progressing here. Keep in mind, Wall Street's going to be back in the game tomorrow. And you know what kind of mood they're in. Notice we got a potential bearish divergence building here. So you can see that the rally, the counter trend rally, the dead cat bounce, whatever you want to call it, it's already starting to run out of steam. I mean, where are the bulls? There's just not that much volume here. So to finish off this commentary, just off the four hour basis, I think we're in sort of dead cat bounce mode. My comment here was bear trend, but we hit some short term objectives, frog and bombs, ABCDs. Bull momentum divs off the lower time frame here suggested that it was way too late to short. And I think that was the case. And interesting how bear divs are now starting to form. You know, you see where reload zones are, right? So I said reload zone tags should represent new money trades or add trades for location. Having said that, three lower highs here now might actually start setting up a bearish trend continuation trade or my bot, right? Because I think I told you I absolutely love my bot. Uh, although it's getting bigger and fatter by the daily basis. Arr, arr, arr. But we're in the midst of a massive M structure top. So what usually happens here is you get your M, then you get the initial dump that confirms the M. We get the counter trend rally that kisses the previous breakdown level. Then we start to carve out the bot levels. One high, three highs, 25%. Bot set up, rock and roll, A, B, C, D. So, and that's actually what I think is going to actually happen here. But that's just Brian's opinion. Who knows what the hell is going to happen? We can't even think about that stuff down the road right now. What we have to think about here is, uh, you know, if you are short off of this M, then great, way to go. Um, I'm not doing anything to this position. In fact, I'm willing to risk to new highs here on this. Not, don't want to touch it. Now, if you're a lower time frame player, did you take this long in here? Do you have your levels? Are you killing it right now? Right? That's uh, this kind of conversation. But I don't even want to get into that with you guys on social media. What I will say is there were some fun ideas through the weekend. This one's kind of funny. And if anything, this is the danger of being so public about what you say and do. Because I think, you know, in one of my recent videos, I said that I was going to work a sell order up at this 2.618. Market was rocking and rolling. Now, do you think somebody on Binance who's got the order book for this knows that that beamish clown has publicly come out and said that he's going to sell some up here? <laughs> Clearly, yes. You know, and this happens a lot when I if I kept this quiet and I didn't say anything, this thing would have blown right up into these foggy boggies. I would have gotten my fill. But because I publicly disclosed that I was going to sell some up here. What a surprise. The market makers running this thing up. They take it right up to into that level and then they stop. <laughs> so anyway, it's a trader's life. So. 
Okay, so this gives you an idea of what I'm doing in altcoin land. I'm actually quite surprised there is still bullishness in this market. And one thing that absolutely kills me about this, but it makes sense if Bitcoin pullbacks through this seasonal window are still within a bull market and pullbacks are buying opportunities. What a surprise, crazy TRI algo is still bullish. Ah, drives me nuts. So uh, I get the feeling any kind of correction here, all it's gonna do is it's just gonna bring the algo back down into buying windows. And there is one gentleman on the site that said, I don't like taking these algo signals unless I have the broader stock market also on board. So it's fascinating how the algo turned up here and you see all the fives and sixes. The market, there are still money to be made. I found it fascinating. Litecoin has actually been rallying through all of this mess. And I, I, you know, on Friday, I was looking at Bitcoin's down $700 a coin. Oh, it's the end of the world. You look over and Litecoin's up. Like what the heck's going on here? So a weird market, very weird. But if anything, perfect analogy. You know what? This is absolutely perfect analogy of 2023 is your buy setup, this window here. And through this 2023, if you can find good quality names to be investing in, to be like investing in, in the crypto space, this is the opportunity. And sadly, big brother, right? And we'll finish, we'll bring it full circle. These guys are gonna try as hard as they possibly can. Then they might even manipulate these people down here. They are gonna try as hard as they possibly can to force you to sell. And that's the tragic part about all of this. These jerks are basically our worst enemy right now. The public. Joe Sixpack, you and me, trying to make a buck, trying to get ahead in this world. What you have to do as an individual is you have to change the equation and you have to acting and thinking the way that they act and think. That through the FUD, get yourself the hell off of these centralized exchanges. Get familiar with DEX technology, get familiar with Ledger, I don't think using the, uh, what's the one Do Kwan had that actually looks like a pear? <laughs> I, I don't think you should use those. What's, what's the other name? Like there's Trezor and then what's the one that looks like a pear? Maybe it's an older version. But anyway, uh, Mr. Kwan was found one with in, in, in a certain place on his body. Did you hear that story, Chris? <laughs> so, was it real or was it just an internet meme? Anyway, hopefully it doesn't get to that because really, you know, I get the feeling, my impression is, is that Big Brother wants to dominate the exchange-driven purchases and quote-unquote investments in crypto. So they're going to say, within your deemed acceptable uh, platforms, your exchange traded funds that are of course completely owned and operated by the 1%, fine. You can buy those in your registered accounts and all the like. All the companies that have jumped through all the hoops and of course do all the audits and have all the accounting firms and the horrendous costs associated with all of that, they played the game, great, you can do that. But guys like CZ, Trex, Cryptopia, <laughs> well, I wouldn't be surprised if KuCoin, Bybit, all these kind of places, Yobit, <laughs> see you later. They are not part of the 1% hegemony. So as a result, a citizen of this nation, you're not allowed to participate. And if you do, we're going to drop the hammer on you. So that's what I think is going on. All right. There you go, folks. Hope you enjoyed all that. You have a pretty good idea of what I'm thinking. Uh, and, pardon me? Okay, that's not bad to answer questions. Um, and, you know, just finish off all of that. I still have a bunch of upside objectives that once we get through this seasonal window, keep in mind, this seasonal week window ends the last week of June. 
So especially if you play the Schult coins and you're new to this game, well, get your Schult shirt together and get your plan ready. Because, you know, if Bitcoin just sort of flounders around here and bobs and weaves and stuff, you might find that the Schultz come off big time. Uh, and if you really wanted to invest in, you know, some of the sexy different Schultz uh, du jour, you know, like the Rend and Roud and all those kind of fun names, Acash, all those really good quality names that Seward really likes. Uh, Rune, I think is another one. Uh, well, just get your act together, put your plan together, get the capital ready, right? And and you got to force yourself to step in because I do think that, you know, once we go through that FOMC meeting uh, there the middle of June, basically one month from now, things could get a little bit dicey in this space again. And we might get ready for like a two or three week face rip down. So just be aware. And interestingly enough, all Bitcoin will do is back up into uh, these buying windows, right? So, you know, this is the daily basis. You can see when that window ends and there's the FUMC. So this part right here is going to be another one like this. Just get ready for it, folks. And then, you know, once we get through that, then we get into the summer fun season and we should have two or three months of banging out doubles and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay, um, let's head on over to the AMAs. Oh, it looks like we got two or three questions. Not really that. Oh, no, that's growing as we speak. Oh, there we go. Okay, number one. Why do you think Canada is trying to get rid of the crypto trading? Is Canada slowly moving towards being a home of the slave? Actually, I would argue that anybody living in our Western civilization is technically a slave, right? As soon as you're born, you get... Uh, uh, what a social insurance number that's what it's called in Canada in the states where they call it a social security number right I'm sure there's probably some sort of reference number in the eurozone you know Norway you could probably tell us what that is and I wouldn't be surprised country by country by country uh, you are all basically a slave from the moment that you are born I do find it interesting that the message that's really drove in home, driven home to all the slaves is the ideal scenario in your life is to be a homeowner, right? And everybody in North America, the most thing you absolutely want to be is a homeowner, which I think actually is a trap. Because once you buy a house, then boom, mortgage. And of course, whatever the face value of the mortgage is, you're probably going to pay twice that amount in and the second half of that amount is interest which means that's your slavery tax and that's where all this goes down to by the way it's the tax tax is our slavery premium they're no longer and in fact it's not even really in the one percent's best interest to own the slaves outright, it's way, way, way better for them to give the slaves the perception that they're free, but just tax the fuck out of them. And, you know, what is money? And I was actually thinking about this today, earlier today. What is money? Money is actually what governments tell you that you can pay your taxes in. That is what money is in any society. Because if you think about it in real terms, you could literally, theoretically, especially a country like Canada, especially like back backwaterberg Russia, you could technically just waltz off into the forest and disappear and completely live off the land money becomes irrelevant it's it's meaningless so what is money and of course money if you take it all the way back to jc's day money was what you had to pay the temple when you went and worshiped your judeo god and of course the money changers remember every single temple visit you had to i think it's called i think it was even called one shekel and it was like a silver coin that you had i i i might have that wrong 
But just go watch the Money Masters video that I tell you guys consistently to watch. Everybody should watch it. Chris, have you ever watched it? I sure hope you better say yes. <laughs> okay, good. But the point here is what's money? And actually King George, I think his name was King George. Or maybe, no, I think it was Henry. King Henry the First of England. He introduced, because money was meaningless. And, you know, the money changers were just absolutely raping people with these shaved off coins that were just getting worth less and less and less and less by the day. You couldn't figure out what the hell money was. He created this system called tally sticks. And the only way you were allowed to pay taxes was with tally sticks. And so instantly, these pieces of wood actually became currency. So if you're at any point wondering what the hell money is, money is what does the government demand of you to pay your annual slavery bill? It's that simple. So can you argue that we are, and then, you know, not to add insult to injury, you know, of course, everybody, you know, be a property owner that gives you rights. You are an official citizen. But of course, as soon as you own property, boom, you have property tax. <laughs> so there is a guaranteed source of income for whatever the government is. And you are on the hook. You are registered as the owner of that property. So you better pay up or the government takes your property from you and it'll auction it off for whatever is not is owing in your taxes. Really good illustration. What is money and why it's in the 1%'s best interest to encourage you to become a homeowner. Not only do they kill you on the mortgage, but governments, they and what an incentive, governments now are incentivized to continually reassess the value of your property higher and higher and higher. Why? Because every time they do it, it's a pay raise for them. Hey, that's a pretty sweet deal. I mean, it's a no-win situation. It's remarkable how the slaves are getting absolutely brutalized here. So, you know, you go out into society, and of course, anytime now in our existence, they even, you know, to pay that property tax, that's your slavery fee, you got to come up with some sort of income, right? Unless you're already independently wealthy. And like in you have a wealth tax. Well, you have this much, all right? You owe this much in tax. Regardless of how wealthy you are, you are, you have to pay whatever your wealth is if it if it if it's any kind of wealth. Isn't that terrible? In North America, of course, they introduced the income tax in the First World War. So now to generate an income to pay those property taxes, they get to take up to 50% of that income in the form of a tax. And then, of course, if you buy anything in our society now, of course, we have goods and services taxes. So now if you do anything in our society, there's a tax. That is your slavery. So to think that we are free right now, uh-uh. We are in, you know, like my country, we're like one of the heaviest tax societies in the world. And it's fascinating how in these stunningly taxed societies, they actually bill us as this is some sort of utopia that we're in here. And, oh, hey, go to Canada, you'll have socialized medicine. The fact that you can't find a doctor, well, that's another thing altogether, get in line, get in the queue. But hey, you got socialized medicine. And if you're a senior citizen, you get to the front of the queue. If you happen to have a heart attack and it looks like you're about to die, heaven forbid, we wouldn't want you to uh, check out of us and not be able to pay your taxes. Well, we'll queue you to the front of the line. We'll give you enough just to keep you alive. Oh, if you're uh, a kid, well, well, you get to bump to the front of the line. <laughs> so a schmuck like me, oh man, uh, sorry, buddy, fucking... You're lucky if you even see a doctor, you ingrateful piece of shit. And of course, uh, pay all your goddamn taxes and shut the fuck up. <laughs> so uh, we, based on what I just said there, uh, I think that we are all slaves as it is right now. It's just, it's a different form of slavery. 
It's a financial slavery that the 1% have set up very efficiently uh, in this modern world uh, to give us the appearance that we are technically free and that we technically have rights and that it's not like somebody can just come to your house and fuck your wife uh, on a whim. Because keep in mind, in Henry the First Day, uh, it used to be that way. So if anything, you should be grateful that you have this system that you have uh, right now to live in. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and maybe cut out that uh, first night reference. And that's what first night uh, is in reference to, if you ever stumble upon that term. But uh, yeah, I mean, basically that it's a very politically incorrect statement. So maybe let's let's just keep this to the people that actually watch this video. We probably don't want to make a short out of this or, you know, uh, all of a sudden the crosshairs are going to start showing up on Brian's forehead again. Man, we don't like that. <laughs> What's that, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> okay, number two, hard made easy. Bye. On a DB, DB sometime, would you be able to talk about considerations if the U.S. actually defaults on its debt? I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around all the ramifications and if there are things that are smart uh, to prepare for on the small chance it actually happens. Well, I hate to say it, but actually I think the absolute best insurance uh, that you can have is to uh, own your Bitcoins. So, you know, just don't have them on a centralized exchange. You know, probably a good idea is to have like a portable, uh, you know, wallet that, you know, is not connected to the interneting. Um, I, I think that's a good idea. Um, I'm, you know, maybe even have two or three. So that, that in case, you know, you know, have one that has a little bit of Bitcoin on it and then have another that has quite a bit more. And then if Big Brother does come and audit you, you can always give them the one with the little Bitcoin. That's what they always say. If you uh, if you're in the hood or something like that and some guys are going to mug you, make sure to have just a little billfold that has like a five or a ten on the outside of it. And the rest of it's just paper. And have like a paper clip or something on it. And then, uh, you know, if somebody, you know, holds a gun or a knife to you, you pull out the, 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 the one with just the single bill on it. You wave it in their front of their face and they go, ooh, look at that. And then you just chuck it. Say, you want my money? Fine. There you go. And of course, that was just, it was a ruse. And then you just run like fucking hell the other direction. <laughs> I hope it doesn't come to that. I don't think it will. But you never know in this crazy world. Uh, I mean, this is actually a really good analogy of can you predict the future? There is a very, in fact, there was a crystal ball kind of guy that was supposed to be a time traveler. And I really liked it. It was back in the 1990s. I saw it on the internet when the internet first came out. And he said that he came from the future and there was a really, really nasty nuclear war here around the 22nd, 23rd century. So interestingly enough, I don't think this cycle is actually the cycle that the shit hits the fan. I think this cycle is the consolidation of power. And if anything, we're probably going to move towards sort of, you know, how ironic because it's going to be Apple. But remember Apple's famous computer about Big Brother, uh, excuse me, Apple's famous commercial in the 1984 Olympics about Big Brother in 1984 and the Macintosh. It's so ironic because I think it's going to be people like Apple and Google and Amazon and Microsoft, and especially Microsoft, that are going to usher in this uh, sort of 21st uh, century age of slavery. Now, the one good part about all of you learning how to manage your own finances, manage your own books, would it be a good idea for you to maybe start dollar cost averaging into some of these big conglomerates? So you are part of the 1% and not part of the schlubs. Do you want to use Bitcoin as your proxy in the tech space? It's not a bad idea. I think the uh, the 1% has deemed that Bitcoin is their way out. Uh, they're not going to use gold because gold's just too widely owned. Bitcoin is perfect because, hey, it's totally technocratic. If you're not part of the technocracy, 
you're you you don't know what the fuck a bitcoin is so i it did its job as a protection of wealth all along here i mean i've shown people repeatedly i know the exact date microsoft got into bitcoin um and yes it was uh, substantially lower than current prices so to answer your question specifically i think actually what's going to happen here is there is going to be a default. But remember, I had said this earlier in the broadcast because I knew this question was coming up. And so I just wanted to quickly circle around to it here. It's going to be a default like 1979, where technically there was a default by the Americans, but because it wasn't into their fiscal year end and they had everything cleaned up, I think what happens is, is that the Democrats in the US government are going to push the Republicans to the brink. And the Republicans are going to say, sorry, we are not going to vote for another $10 trillion in mindless, idiotic spending, which is going to send the U.S. government into default. And of course, the market's going to panic. And this is the real rubbing point. Does the Fed balk and acquiesce to the Peter Finks and the private equity people, because that's what really is going on here. It's a battle between the trillionaire uh, member, Peter Fink is one of these jerks. So it's a battle between him. And then there's this other school that's like the George Bush senior people who consider the banking cartel and the one percent, the you know the the Joey Diamonds of the world, the Goldman Sachs's of the world. Uh, there's a battle going on between what's called the hard money school, which was George Bush Senior, and ironically enough, I actually think that Jerry is a hard money guy. There was an interesting reference by Miss D. Martino Booth to uh, Jerry and a speech he made in 2012. And I actually think Jerry was made a fool of. And you know, you see how white his hair is because he got suckered in to this MMT bullshit. And, you know, keep in mind the Peter Finks and the Joey, Joey Diamonds and the Goldman Sachs, they love suckering the public into this uh, MMT thought because it was like, go and borrow as much money as you can. Money's cheap. Money's cheap. You're going to do great. Great. Now, of course, they're all financial slaves. And if they can't make their payments, the great part about it is the Joey Diamonds and the Goldman Sachs and the Merrill Lynch's and all those people, they literally are now going to take over the U.S. banking system because even the regional banks got suckered in by granny. They all got suckered into this MMT nonsense. And now they are dead. And Joey's sitting there going, oh, man, this couldn't have turned out any more perfectly. Because <laughs> I guarantee you, those guys all know about these cycles. And for them to play dumb through this was, I think, the biggest con job ever. And it will basically ensure another generation slavery, right? Should we be mortgaging our kids' future? Shut the fuck up and turn them into slaves. All right, give them all the money they want. Boom. Now a whole new generation of slaves have been created, just like that. Shocking. Yep. 10 minutes. All right, so my answer to you is, I think that there will be a headline default, but the situation will be resolved by the time we get to the fiscal year end. And Nick, what I would suggest you do is do a little bit of research into how that 1979 event played out. Because I think exactly the same thing is going to happen here. Um, ironically enough, you'll actually see a U.S. debt, which will cause the stock market to fall, which will probably cause risk assets to fall. And then think about what happened in March of 2020. And the way uh, the banksters all were like, oh, go and, you know, get more debt, more debt, more debt. And if the stock market thumping is hard enough, then the politicians, the Republicans will acquiesce 
And okay, fine, we'll raise the debt ceiling, blah, 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 mortgage the kids' future, blah, 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 blah. And I still think, and this is my thesis, call me crazy, but this is what I've been saying since day one, that this cycle actually plays out something like this, where 23 is the bottoming year, setting up the base for the next cycle. And ironically enough, it will be this debt ceiling debate that creates this scenario and of course, the public is going to be dumping and you know who is going to be on the buy side, scooping up everything, Bitcoin, stocks, commodities, whatever. They'll just be loading up the boat and it's just business as usual. All right, there you go, sir. Sure hope you enjoyed that. Number three. Hi, Brian. Do you think the emergence of AI will eventually make us as traders obsolete? Eh, maybe. Maybe. Remember, all of these algorithms and stuff, they're only as good as the programmers of the algorithm. And then also remember too, does Joe Sixpack do a lot of this AI stuff or does the 1% do this? And so then you have to think about, and this is kind of, I think, where Musk is going. Do you think that AI is going to be used against the public? Which I think the answer is an unequivocal yes. And AI is going to encourage you as a public person to panic and sell. And AI will actually be the buyers of your panic FUD selling. Absolutely. So first and foremost, the AIs are really just a representation of who drives the AI. And if the AI is used against the public, then yeah, I could easily see that happen. You know, I think the world that we're heading into is Blade Runner. So I don't, I haven't never watched the recent remakes and I'm sure it's totally dumbed down and totally woke and really not realistic. Go and watch the original movie from the 1970s. And I think actually it was the late 70s, early 80s. And I think that is the world that we're heading into. So that's my answer to that. Uh, I'm concerned that everything has been learning at TRI will be replaced by AI trading. Well, I guess the question I would have for you is what you're, what I'm actually trying to teach you to do here at, at TRI, which is kind of funny, I said this earlier, is I'm actually trying to teach you to get ready to buy an, on this event. I'm actually trying to teach you how to be, uh, wait for it, wait for it, one of these guys. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I've done it. I've created some absolute monsters out there. These people, they've used Bitcoin as their proxy, but they're so wealthy that for fun, they're going and buying land up in countries that they would like to see the land return back to its natural state. <laughs> I remember one guy that did the TRI program way back when, and he became so stick and rich. That, that's what he does now is he just buys land and returns it back to like forests. <laughs> so really what I'm trying to teach you is how to be one of these people. Do you think that these people understand the concept of divergences? Do you think that these people understand the concept of, hey, somebody just posted in the lounge, Leanne James, right? And that's basically what... Um, uh what this setup was that i was talking about earlier right i am only allowed to buy if i see a w on the other side of this trend line that's what i'm trying to teach you how to do and could you build bots and ai and all that i mean i showed you guys earlier the google searches this will never go away folks I mean, it's just, it's the way these stupid humans work. Well, I guess I got rid of it. But anyway, uh, scroll back in the video. I don't know what timestamp it was, but uh, where I showed you that Google search. Uh, Google searches for Bitcoin, right? The public is not interested in Bitcoin right now. The fact that you are and you want to learn how to hunt like weekly Ws and reload zones and bullish momentum divergences and Ws to help frame uh, risk you you are actually learning everything that i'm trying to teach you that the one percent does because keep in mind i learned it from the one percent it's not like it's rocket science it's just that nobody in the public even knows this 
And when do the public participate? The public always participates right at the top of the market. It's so cliche. And then when we get to the top of the market, it's your job as a market professional not to get sucked into the euphoria. When people say this time it's what? Let's see if you people on YouTube are listening to me. When you hear someone say this time it's what? That's actually your notice to get the front out. Or at least pay yourself a little bit so that if we do go into a very typical correction, you can at least continue to pay your rent and bills. And taxes. Because remember, that's what the damn money, that's that's what money's all about. It's paying your slavery fee. All right, sure hope I answered that. Number four, in the Rational Investor ISM document. Uh, okay, isms. Oh, I see, isms. <laughs> I couldn't find several terms used by you in videos. Please explain to newcomers and add the following terms to the document. BB. Uh, that could be anything. Brian Beamish, Bollinger Bands, Big Booty. I don't know. Uh I have no idea. It could be. I got to go with Brian Beamish, Bollinger Bands, or Big Booty. So it's one of those. Shot. Well, that's easy. That's a sell half on a double. S H O D. And we'll even make that a capital. And we'll go uh, there. Sell half on double. And usually when I do shod, I actually do that as a lowercase so you can kind of try and remember it. BFF, this is a pretty recent term that I've sort of warmed up to. So I can understand why this wouldn't be on there. But this is uh, Brian's favorite FIP. So the question is, what the hell is that? So I'm not going to answer that, but that's what BFF stands for. And then <laughs> FOMC, well, that stands for Federal Open Market Committee. And this is uh, anybody who plays in the market, you know, you heard how much I talked about the Fed and the banksters and all that. So uh, hopefully that's a fairly easy term for you to catch on to. Uh, I suppose I have to spell it correctly. And then F-U-M-C, well, uh, use your imagination. <laughs> that's probably just the best way I'm going to say this. This is probably going to get me in trouble. There's probably going to be some some big brother person that comes along here and uh, doesn't like that and crosshairs to the forehead and all that stuff. Okay, look at that. Right on one o'clock, I made it. Phew. <laughs> so, uh, two and a half hours, PMA for the win. Gave you a whole bunch of rants. Also, I think I did some pretty good uh, Bitcoin analysis there for you. Uh, answered a few questions from site members. Um, told you a little bit about how the system actually works. Uh, yeah, everybody, all 49 of you, can you please all collectively go, okay, Liam, just be in a good space today, please. Tummy's okay. Attitude's okay. No head banging. Maybe even tell dad that you love him. I don't know, something crazy like that. Uh, you know, maybe even say a prayer for Jojo. Just remember, the only reason why I'm talking to any of you is because she came to me from the other side just about exactly 10 years ago, said that I had the potential to make a positive difference in this world. And I really had to learn how to listen um, so I think I've done her words of guidance justice. Uh, I hope spirit is happy also too, you know, sadly, we've had a few people, uh, that were TRI people pass over that time period. So Joby, I'm thinking of you, buddy, Cole, I'm thinking of you, uh, of course, relatives uh, have passed, uh, Doe, you know, the little old lady that you guys, uh, get to know in the level one that's actually my aunt doe she was the sweetest little old lady and i loved her dearly i was very very sad when she passed so pma for the win slow and steady wins the race 
trying to make that positive difference in the world. I am a bit salty, though. Uh, I, I granted. I sure hope you guys take advantage of this free resource. If you need some help, I mean, it's a little too late now, but you could maybe consider joining our reservation list for the fall. Uh, next intake will be in September. So uh, good luck to all the students that have uh, hopped on with us. Uh, you know, best wishes to all of you. Of course, I'm only a question away. And just remember, anybody who's watching this, if you are in the education program, it doesn't matter what level. Like uh, you saw somebody in that Q&A document is an OG on the site who asked a question. Um, you know, feel free to ask. That's what I'm here for. It's trying to help. All right. Take it easy. Uh, slow and steady wins the race. Don't take no wooden nickels. You know what your number one job is to do? Chris, if you can take on a slow year, I'd love you for it. The only thing that for Brian to say at this point is bye.